of infection, the chain of infection. So let me hand out something to you here. Please let me know. Okay. All right. Any questions before I get started on anything that I've talked about? Um, I'm going to have you tomorrow for phlebotomy, as Mr. Bernard said. Okay. And I'm going to touch a little bit more and go a little deeper um, into what he talked about. Um, I'm very much a person who's into compliance. Um, at my last uh, institution, uh, as he was talking about OSHA and Stericycle, I was the OSHA compliance. Uh, person on the campus, which meant I handled all of the biohazard and all of that for everyone. For, so that means nursing department, um, if massage had something, dental, um, MA, um, except for HVAC, all, anyone who was in the healthcare um, um, department, they had to bring all of their sharps to me. I was the one who had to call and make sure that it was picked up. I had to make sure that everything was in compliance, that we um, labeled it and, and, and packed it up properly and so forth. I was the one who also made sure that if I saw something that was in the sharps container that it wasn't supposed to be in there, I quickly snapped it shut, even though if it hadn't uh, been to the right level and put it away. Why? Because if OSHA came in and saw a glove or a two by two gauze or something like that in there, that's a $7,000 fine. But your food and your drinks on your table, that's a that's now not 10, it's 20,000. So I would go around and say 10, 20, 30, 40, and usually I got about to 300,000. I only have maybe 15 students in there or something. Why? Because, and I'm talking when I thought it was 10,000. It's now $20,000 fine. Why? Because this is an OSHA regulated lab, okay? OSHA regulated. There's something else we're going to talk about too that you're going to learn. It's called CLIA, CLIA of 1988, okay? And that's Clinical Laboratory Improvement. Amendment of 1988 and basically um, it was formed in 88 because it set the standards of how we're supposed to dress and conduct ourselves in a lab. So that means you see my little ponytail, I'm out of compliance with CLIA. I'm supposed to have it up off my shoulders. I have to make sure that my nails are no longer than a quarter inch. I, I, may, I have to make sure that they're clean. I cannot have polish on them. Um, I cannot have even clear polish. I'm not supposed to have clear polish or any type of color. Um, if I have tattoos, I have to make sure that I cover them up. Um, facial piercings, they have to be removed, including tongue piercings. I cannot have a nose piercing. Why? Because what if I'm working with a fluid or, you know, someone sneezes or they, you know, urine and it spills and now it's going into an opening in my face. Do you want that? We don't want that. If I were to wipe or just swab this area here, you would be amazed at what you would pick up on the floor, on, on the table, okay? Or on your fingers. That's why we don't want you to drink or eat in the lab, okay? It's really for your safety, not only um, for the patient's safety, but it's for your safety. So we're gonna talk about how this chain of infection affects not only you in the lab, but it affects you here in this classroom as well, okay? All right, so the chain of infection. We start off with five infectious agents, five infectious agents, or we call them pathogens, pathogens. The first one is fungi, and it's not in any particular order. All right, fungi or fungus, okay? Fungi is the plural for fungus. Can anybody give me an example of what you think a fungus is? Mold, good, good, mold, anyone else? Anything else? Sometimes women experience this. Infection. Yeast infection, right. So fungi, that's one type of infectious agent. Yeast, mold, those are in, uh, some examples. Bacteria, we're all pretty familiar with bacteria, right? Okay, so um, we're not going to get, I'm not going to get into the depth of the, uh, what the cell is made of, what, you know, that it's a uh, eukaryote or prokaryote. I'm not going to get into that, but I just want to just touch on the five different types of agents. All right, the next one is a virus. Very familiar with that, right? Can viruses be treated with an antibiotic? Why not? It's not bacteria. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, yes, it's not bacteria. 
But what do you think that's unique about a virus why it cannot be treated with an antibiotic? Because you know a lot of times we go in there and we're sick and we're like, I need an antibiotic. And the doctor comes and he swabs, he does something and he finds out what? That you don't have a bacterial infection, you have a viral infection. And so they cannot give you antibiotics. Anyone? Okay. All right. Basically, viruses are composed of a type of phospholipid cell. So basically, nothing can penetrate that, okay, when we're talking about um, an antibiotic. It cannot penetrate that. Viruses are basically going to go into a body. It's going to find a host, okay, and it's going to basically um, consume that, um, that cell, and it's going to change the makeup of it, okay, and then continue to multiply. So antibiotics cannot actually, they're not effective um, with, a, with a virus. It is effective with bacteria, okay? All right, protozoa, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting word. Protozoa, anyone give me an example? What do you think a protozoa is? It's a parasite, okay? It's a parasite, all right? So protozoas are parasites. They have a clearly defined nucleus. And then the last one is rickettsiae, rickettsiae. I know that sounds like rickets, right? Rickettsiae, all right. Anyone can think of what an example of rickettsiae? Those are ticks, you heard of ticks? It's an example of ticks or fleas or lice, meaning that it's a type of infection that is carried by one of those types of organisms, okay? So we have those five infectious agents. That means that whenever you are going to take a swab of a culture, whenever you find some type of pathogen, it's gonna be either in a fungi, bacteria, virus, protozoa, or rickettsiae family, okay? It's always gonna be one of those five. Now, I'm telling you all this, but guess what? You are gonna have a quiz on this. Look at the looks that I'm giving. <laughs> All right, you're gonna have a quiz. Because how else are you gonna be able to remember it, right? You really need to know the chain of infection. You're gonna see this over and over and over again in so many different courses, okay? But it's really important that you keep this in mind. Why? For your safety when you get out in the field. After I learned about the chain of infection, I walk into a bathroom differently. I handle myself in the bathroom differently. I watch people when they're in the restaurant, when they're at the um, Golden Corral. I don't even know if I wanna eat a Golden Corral anymore because I'm like, mm-mm. When we get down here and we talk about the indirect and direct, and I'm going to tell you about the story. When I just went into the store last night, and a guy sneezed, and I was like, let me go around this way. Because he was sneezing over there. Why? Because I didn't want to walk in the mist. We're going to get to that in a minute. It makes you think about these things, okay? All right. Okay, so we have our five infectious agents. Now, how else are they going to be able to um, be carried but by reservoir hosts. So either people, food, insects, animals, and we talked about um, some of these insects. It could be like ticks, lice, things like that. Exam tables, contaminated instruments, water. This is who or what harbors the pathogen. So these are um, types of vices that can actually carry or harbor a pathogen. So let's just use people. We're gonna go with people, first one, all right? Human being, all right? And let's say that we have a uh, bacterial infection. So we're gonna go with bacterial infection, um, we're gonna go with um, people, and then we're gonna go through the chain, of, um, the, the chain of infection. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand is the reason why I put this in the middle here, the number one um, universal precaution is hand washing because no matter what, that's the best way to wash your, to be able to um, get rid of the uh, pathogen, right? Or at least minimize the, the pathogen, okay? And, and being an, an infectious agent. Um, to either today, or I don't know if uh, Mr. Bernard's gonna show you, or I can show you, but I'm gonna demonstrate how to perform a medical aseptic hand wash. That's not like any hand wash, you just go in there and you do this and you're gone. There's a particular way, there's a system and a method of how you wash your hands to make sure that you get in the web spaces on the back of your hands, your thumbs, your wrists, to have to, to make sure that you are washing your hands properly. Hey, they're going to get their stethoscopes today at okay. nine. Okay. So let's we'll cover that after we break after we stop at perfect. nine to get that. Perfect, perfect. Okay. All right. So we have um, the reservoir host, and that's who or what harbors a pathogen. Now. The, first, the next step right here is that it first has to leave. It's got to leave or mode or a portal of exit. It's got to go out through the mouth, the mouth, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, or body fluids. But standard precautions can prevent that. What's a standard precaution? Universal precaution, hand washing, okay? 
or you can use something else. Does anybody else think of something that you can use to try to prevent? Sanitize. Sanitize, right, sanitization, right? Sanitizer or sandy wipes, okay? All right, that's something else. Now, let's get down here to the mode of transmission. We have indirect and we have direct. Indirect is uh, contact is either by uh, someone sneezes, they cough, uh, they ingest, which means they're consuming um, the bacteria, because we said we're going to use that as, um, as our example, um, and it's droplets are airborne. So as I was telling you, I was walking through the store, and the guy was coming out of one department, and he sneezed, and so I walked to the left because I can see, I didn't even need to see that commercial, I already know what's happening. It's lingering in the air. When I hear somebody sneezing around the corner, I know it's lingering in the air for at least 30 seconds, and if I walk into that, right, I'm inhaling that, I'm ingesting that, that's by indirect contact. Okay, I didn't have to touch it, it's, it went into my body, right? Okay, so that's droplets or airborne. The other way I can have a mode of transmission is uh, direct contact, and that's with body fluids, urine, um, CSF is cerebral spinal fluid, touching feces, blood, and now you understand why we're telling you don't drink or eat. Can you imagine? You go to the restroom, you didn't wash your hands properly, didn't perform a medical aseptic hand wash, you come in here and touch the table, and then somebody comes and opens up a bag of Fritos or something, and they just licking their fingers and touching the table, and they just put all this in their bodies. One of these five pathogens. Does it make sense now? Why you don't want to eat and drink in here? Okay, that, I wouldn't want to eat and drink. Now, there's three ways you can actually um, reduce, eliminate, or completely destroy. The three down here, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is new. It's called sanitization, disinfection, or sterilization. All right, so I want you to write for sanitization. See the SA? SA sanitization. That means reducing pathogens to a safe level. Think of SA, the first two letters in safe, and sanitization, SA. Reducing pathogens to a safe level. So does that mean that I've destroyed them? Does it mean that I've killed them? Not necessarily. It used to bother me when I watched uh, commercials way back in the day because I was very observant with that. And I noticed that they would always show this little, you know, picture and they would have all these little bacteria, amoebas or whatever. And then they would use the hand sanitizer and then all the bacteria, whatever the germs were gone. And I'm like, that's not true. That's not true at all. Because even if it says 99%, that, that's not killing anything. You are not getting rid of, any, you're reducing pathogens to a safe level. So that also kind of unnerves me when I go into a hospital and I see doctors going in and out and I also see medical staff going in and out and they're not washing their hands and they're just constantly using the hand sanitizer as if that's going to do something and get rid of all of the pathogens. It does not. The only way to do it is what? Washing your hands and doing a medical aseptic hand wash. And, or if you're going into surgery, we call it a, um, a surgical aseptic hand wash, okay? so. Sanitization means what? Reducing pathogens to a safe level, okay? So we have sandy wipes. When we wipe down the tables before and after we, we, we perform our procedures, we're only what? Reducing it to a safe level. For me to destroy pathogens, that's disinfection. So I think of D, disinfection, D, destruction. Okay, that's a good way to do it. SA, safe, sanitization. Reducing pathogens to a safe level. Disinfection is destroying all pathogens. So this is going to have a little bit more of effect. Can anybody think of a disinfection type that we could use? Disinfection. What's something that we could use that's a disinfectant? That you use probably every day in your house. Disinfection. Mm -hmm. What else? Lysol. Lysol spray. That's a disinfectant, right? So that's going to what? That's going to destroy pathogens. You'll see on there, they'll have what? Destroy viruses. Um, they'll have all kinds of you know, pathogens that they'll list on there, bacteria, whatever, right? Because it's actually destroying it. It's taking it a little deeper to the next level. All right. Sterilization. That is complete destruction of all pathogens or microorganisms. Complete destruction. Now, the way we do this is we have to actually what? Sterilize our instruments. Okay, where we're actually sterilizing the instruments and then we put them in an autoclave. So if we were to start from the very beginning, let's start with sanitization again. If I had some instruments and I'm working and I just assisted the physician in an office procedure, say I removed a mole or I moved something off of the patient's arm, right? I need to go 
and I need to sanitize the instruments first, which means I'm going to take a metal brush or I'm going to take almost like a toothbrush and I'm going to open up the instruments and I'm going to sanitize them, which means I have to scrub them and brush them. So they have something, little lines in here and we're going to, they call, they're called serrations. So we want to make sure that we go the same direction and then the opposite direction. I want to make sure that I open up the instrument because if I've actually entered into a body cavity, it could have fluid, it could have blood on there, so I have to clean all of that plus the ring holder, okay, where you're putting your fingers to open and close, right? So I've got to clean that as well. That's sanitizing, okay? Or we can put it in um, a type of solution that kind of, um, it's like an ultrasonic solution and that'll also sanitize it as well. After I do that, I rinse it off and then I want to um, put it in a disinfectant solution. Now we've had metacide, germicide, there's different types. Side means what? To kill. CID. So whenever you see uh, some type of solution or it has side, metacide, that means that it's going to kill. So that's destroying. So I sanitize the instruments first, I brush them, and then I rinse them, and then I'm going to put them in disinfectant solution. How many of you get your nails done? Mm. Do you look at the packet? You know what I'm talking about when you pull the instruments out? Do you look at that? The little plastic thing. Uh -huh. The little plastic polypropylene bag. Do you, do you have to flip it over? Do, do you know whether it's actually went to the autoclave? Do you know if they just, you know, maybe rinsed it and put it in solution for 30 minutes, which is supposed to be 24 hours, and then just slid it on in a bag and sealed it? And here you go. You don't know what you're getting, do you? Go to the GYN, same thing. Do I know if they actually sanitize those instruments? and sterilize them and disinfect them? Do I know that? How can I tell to inspect the bag? We're going to show you the bag, the little bags that they put them in. It's, it has paper on one side and plastic on the other, and then you pull off the label and you seal it. When you put it and you, it is exposed to high heat, you'll be able to see on the bag there's a color. It'll, say, it'll be either pink or blue. It's got to change to a dark color, either black or brown. When you see that, you can also see the condensation of the paper and usually it shrivels up, okay? But whenever you go anywhere and someone is getting ready to use some instruments that's either going to be used on your body or going inside your body, short of being under anesthesia where you can't see that, you need to inspect everything that's going to be touching you. How do you think we develop different types and we, and, and we um, get different types of diseases and we have yeast infections and things like that on our nails? because they're cutting back the cuticle. When they cut back the cuticle, what is that? That's my protective barrier for my body. I don't want you to cut my cuticle back. I know it looks nice, but now it allows everything to go right into my body and I have no protection. You all hear what I'm saying? Make sure you're checking your instruments. When you are in the field, you're gonna to have to do the same thing. You're gonna to have to sanitize those instruments and then rinse it and disinfect the instruments. If it says to keep it in that solution for 24 hours, you need to keep it in there for 24 hours, not 30 minutes. Because if a patient gets sick, they die, something happens, they're gonna trace it all the way back to the instruments that were used in that procedure. And your initials and the date is gonna be on that pack, packet. So they're gonna trace it back to you and say, you were the one who, who uh, put it together. So you're the one who's responsible, right? And what do you think they can do? You, you could go to jail, okay, depending on how serious it is. They could take away your certification. I mean, there's a lot of things they could do to you. So it's very serious how we, t uh, we, we look at the chain of infection and how we uh, expose our patients because I always looked at it. When I was cleaning my instruments, I cleaned it like it was going inside my, my family, my loved one. I, I looked at it like every instrument I cleaned, this was going inside my mother. And I would look up in the light, and if I couldn't see through the curette, which is um, something that you use that they use also when they're cleaning your feet or you know doing pedicures and manicures and things like that or if we're just trying to um, or as podiatrists we, we get into the cuticle area so if I can't see through it that means that there's still tissue in there and then I can actually do what expose a patient or someone else to that okay and I'm transferring one of these five pathogens to another patient all right so we have to think about that all right so sterilization complete Destruction of all microorganisms, which means I'm going to put it in, in heat, right? I'm going to um, use some type of um, uh, steam so that I can completely kill all the microorganisms that are on that instrument. I use that if I was, what, having a procedure in a hospital, right? Okay. Now, come back up here. 
mode or uh, portal of entry. So if I have not washed my hands, I have not sanitized, not disinfected sterilization, it's going to continue on through the chain of infection. I'm now here uh, where it can go back into my body, mouth, nose, eyes, cut, abrasions. Of course, I want to use standard precaution, hand washing or one of the other um, techniques down here that we talked about. Now, my body's going to respond in two ways, either humor or cell-mediated response. Humor response means that my body is going to produce antibodies. When a foreign antigen comes into my body, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, something's not right. My body's going to produce antibodies, and that's the humoral uh, response. It does the same thing um, that's involved if I were to have, if I were to bump myself against this table right here, and then my, my, my uh, flesh becomes warm and red, it's the same humoral response because it's sending antibodies, it's, sending, it's saying, hey, I need help, there's an injury right here at the site. Okay. Cell-mediated response is something that happens uh, that's called phagocytosis. So basically, if I had a cell here, okay, and and I have, uh, let's say that's my bacteria, my cell is going to move towards here, and then what's going to happen is it's going to consume, which is called phagocytosis. Did you guys have uh, medical terminology yet? Okay, so what's osis mean? Abnormal condition, right. Because condition is IA, but abnormal condition is osis. What's phago? To eat. And what's site? Cell. cell. Okay, so abnormal condition of what? Eating the cell eating something that's abnormal. That's what your cell-mediated response is doing, okay? So it's gonna come and that's one of the responses. And then humor response is what? Antibodies, okay, that are being produced. Now, again, if I haven't performed um, universal precaution with hand washing, standard precaution, now I'm gonna go into the susceptible host. My two um, most vulnerable would be children and elderly. If they do, uh, if they're not keeping up with their immunizations, they're gonna be more prone to what? more diseases, uh, getting sick, and so forth, right? They're the ones who are at most risk. So I also want to make sure that I have an intact um, integumentary system or intact skin, okay? That also helps as well. So if I do not stop or break the chain of infection at any one of these sites, by uh, any one of these stages, by either hand washing or by using hand sanitizer, disinfecting, use sterilization, then what? The cycle's going to continue and continue, right? until I break the cycle, all right? Okay, so that's in a nutshell, the chain of infection, all right? But we're gonna be applying this when we're, when we're going through um, our different uh, types of um, skills labs and things like that. I'm gonna be asking you questions, Mr. Bernard will be asking you questions. What's, uh, what can we do to make sure that we prevent um, or break the chain of infection at this point? We'll be using standard precautions or what will we, what will we do? Like wearing PPE and things like that, personal protective equipment. All right. Any questions? Everybody got this? You can recite this back just like that? All right. Okay.